Preface to the second German edition of Religion and Philosophy in Germany, a fragment, by Heinrich Heine, 1797-1856, originally published in 1833 in French. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Preface to the Second German Edition When the first edition of this book was published, on taking up a copy of it, I was a little horrified at the mutilation it had suffered, a mutilation of which traces were everywhere visible. Here an adjective was wanting, there a parenthesis, Entire passages were omitted, regardless of the context, so that not only the meaning, but frequently the intention of the writer was lost. It was much more the fear of Caesar than the fear of God that directed the mutilating hand, and whilst all that was insidious from a political point of view was anxiously cast aside, statements the most suspicious regarding religion were permitted to stand thus the real tendency of the book a patriotic democratic tendency had vanished and there stared at me from its pages like an unholy thing a quite strange apparition that recalled scholastic theological polemics and that was deeply offensive to the humanistic toleration of my disposition at first i flattered myself with the hope that in a second impression i would be able to fill up the gaps in the book but no restoration of this kind is now possible as the original manuscript disappeared from the house of my publisher during the great fire in hamburg footnote the conflagration of eighteen forty two the manuscript was, however, subsequently recovered, and Dr. Stoltman made use of it in preparing the complete German edition of Heine's work, published by Hoffmann and Kamp, Hamburg. Translator. End of footnote. My memory is too weak to afford me assistance through an effort of recollection and besides on account of the state of my eyes any minute revision of the book is impossible i therefore content myself with retranslating from the french version published before the german version several of the longer passages omitted and with intercalating them here one of these passages which has been reprinted in innumerable french journals which has been debated about and which was even discussed in last year's session of the chamber of deputies by one of the greatest of french statesmen count mole is to be found at the end of this new edition it may serve to show the true state of the case as to the detraction and degradation of germany in the eyes of other nations for which as certain worthy people asserted i have been to blame but in the sadness of my soul i give vent to my feelings regarding the old official germany that musty land of philistines though it brought forth no goliath no not one great man there were those that knew how to represent me as speaking of the actual germany of the great mysterious as it may be called anonymous germany of the german people the sleeping sovereign with whose crown and sceptre the apes are at play this insinuation of the worthy folk found the readier acceptance as it was absolutely impossible for me during a long period to make any declaration of my real opinion particularly was this the case at the time when the decrees of the german confederacy against young germany appeared decrees directed mainly against myself which brought me into an exceptional condition of restraint such as had been hitherto unheard of in the annals of press bondage when by and by i was at liberty to loosen the muzzle a little my thoughts still remained gagged 
The book now before the reader is and must remain a fragment. To confess frankly, I had rather that I could leave the book altogether unpublished, and for this reason, that since its first appearance my views on many subjects, especially with regard to sacred things, have undergone important change, and much that was then asserted is now opposed to my better convictions. But the arrow ceases to belong to the archer as soon as it speeds from the string of his bow, and the word ceases to belong to the speaker as soon as it springs from his lips and is multiplied by the press. Besides, I should, by leaving this book unpublished, and by withdrawing it from the complete series of my works, incur the opposition of those having urgent claims upon me. I might, it is true, as is customary with authors in such cases, have recourse to the expedient of toning down expressions, of throwing a veil of phrases over my thoughts, but from the depth of my soul I abhor all equivocal language, hypocritical flows of speech, cowardly fig leaves. Yet, as an honorable man, there remains under all circumstances the inalienable right of openly acknowledging his error, a right that I shall here fearlessly exercise. I therefore candidly express that everything contained in this book having reference to the great question of the existence of God is as false as it is unadvised. As unadvised and as false is also the assertion mimicked from the schools that deism is in theory destroyed and that it now only drags out a miserable existence in the material world. No, it is not true that the critique of reason which has destroyed the arguments for the existence of God familiar to mankind since the time of Anselm of Canterbury, has likewise made an end of God himself. Deism lives, lives its most living life. It is not dead, and least of all has it been killed by the newest German philosophy. This fine-spun German dialectic is incapable of enticing a dog from the fireside. It has not power to kill a cat how much less a god. I have in my own body had experience how slight is the danger of its killing. It is continually at its work of killing, and yet folk remain alive. The doorkeeper of the Hegelian school, the grim Rug, once obstinately maintained that he had slain me with his porter's staff in the Holly Chronicle though at that very time I was strolling along the boulevards of Paris, healthy and gay, and more unlike dying than ever. Poor worthy Rouge! He himself, at a later period, could not restrain the most honest outburst of laughter when I made him the confession here in Paris that I had never so much as seen that terribly homicidal journal, the Holly Chronicle and my full ruddy cheeks as well as the hearty appetite with which I swallowed oysters convinced him how little like a corpse I looked. In fact, in those days I was still healthy and sleek. I stood in the zenith of my fat and was as arrogant as Nebuchadnezzar before his fall. Alas, a few years later a physical and mental change began to take place. How often since those days have I thought of the history of the Babylonian king, who esteemed himself as no less than God, but who, having miserably fallen from the summit of his infatuation, crawled like an animal on the ground, eating grass, which would no doubt be salad. This story is to be found in the grandiose and splendid book of Daniel, a story which I recommend to the edifying contemplation, not only of the worthy Rug, but to that of my far more unregenerate friends, these godless self-gods, Feuerbach, Dahmer, Brunner, Bauer, Hengstenberg, and whatever else be their names. Besides this one, there are indeed many other beautiful and worthy narratives in the Bible, which would be worthy of their attention, 
as for example just at the beginning there is the story of the forbidden fruit in paradise and of the serpent that little private tutoress who lectured on hegelian philosophy six thousand years before hegel's birth this blue stocking without feet demonstrated very ingeniously how the absolute consists in the identity of being and knowing how man becomes god through cognition or what is the same thing how the god in man thereby attains self-consciousness this formula is not so clear as the original words when ye eat of the tree of knowledge ye shall be as god mother eve understood only one thing in the whole demonstration that the fruit was forbidden and because it was forbidden the good woman ate of it but she had scarcely eaten the enticing apple when she lost her innocence her naive ingenuousness and discovered that she was much too naked for a person of her position the ancestors of so many future emperors and kings and she desired a dress truly but a dress of fig leaves because in her day no lyonese silk manufacturers had yet come into the world and because there were in paradise no milliners and dressmakers o oh, paradise strange as soon as woman attains reasoning self-consciousness her first thought is of a new dress and this same biblical narrative particularly the saying of the serpent keeps running in my mind so that i should like to place it at the beginning of my book by way of motto and in the same manner as one often sees at the gates of princely gardens aboard of the warning inscription here are man traps and spring guns in my latest book romancero i have explained the transformation that took place within me regarding sacred things since its publication many inquiries have been made with zealous importunity as to the manner in which the true light dawned upon me pious souls thirsting after a miracle have desired to know whether like saul on the way to damascus i had seen a light from heaven or whether like balaam the son of beor i was riding on a restive ass that suddenly opened its mouth and began to speak as a man no ye credulous believers i never journeyed to damascus nor do i know anything about it save that lately the jews there were accused of devouring aged monks of st francis and i might never have known even the name of the city had i not read the song of songs wherein the wise king compares the nose of his beloved to a tower that looked towards damascus nor have i ever seen an ass at least any four-footed one that spoke as a man though i have often enough met men who whenever they opened their mouths spake as asses in truth it was neither vision nor a seraphic revelation nor a voice from heaven nor any strange dream or any mystery that brought me into the way of salvation and i owe my conversion simply to the reading of a book a book yes it is an old homely-looking book modest as nature and natural as it a book that has a work-a-day and unassuming look like the sun that warms us like the bread that nourishes us a book that seems to us as familiar and as full of kindly blessing as the old grandmother who reads daily in it with dear trembling lips and with spectacles on her nose and this book is called quite shortly the book the bible rightly do men also call it the holy scriptures for he that has lost his god can find him again in this book and towards him that has never known god it sends forth the breadth of the divine word the jews who appreciate the value of precious things knew right well what they did when at the burning of the second temple they left to their fate the gold and silver implements of sacrifice 
the candlesticks and lamps even the breastplate of the high priest adorned with great jewels but saved the bible this was the real treasure of the temple and thanks be to god it was not left a prey to the flames or to the fury of titus vespasian the wretch who as the rabbin tell us met with so dreadful a death a jewish priest who lived at jerusalem two hundred years before the burning of the second temple during the splendid era of ptolemy philadelphus and who was called joshua ben cyrus ben eliezer has written down for us in a collection of apothegms or meshalim the thoughts of his about the bible and here i will impart to you his beautiful words there is in them a sacerdotal solemnity and yet they are as refreshing as if they had but yesterday welled forth from a living human breast and the words are as follows all this is the book of the covenant made with the most high god namely the law that moses commanded as a precious treasure to the house of jacob wisdom floweth therefore as the water of pison when it is great and as the water of tigris when it overspreadeth its banks in spring instruction floweth from it as the euphrates when it is great and as jordan in the harvest correction breaketh forth from it as the light and as the water of the nile in autumn there is none that hath ever made an end of learning it there is none that will ever find out all its mystery for its wisdom is richer than any sea and its word deeper than any abyss written in paris in the month of may eighteen fifty two End of Preface to the Second German Edition of Religion and Philosophy in Germany, a Fragment, by Heinrich Heine, 1797-1856. to